I want to talk to you today about what happens when a Christian sins against liberty. Uh, liberty in your New Testament is basically where you have freedom to make a choice. Uh, there is no absolute set standard doctrine. This is the way it is. You can't, you know, disagree or whatever else. Um, and we're going to start out by defi defining what is liberty. Okay. Turn your Bible to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. I'll show you a good definition of what is liberty. Acts chapter 27 verses 1 through 3. And it was when it was determined that we should sail unto, into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus's band. And entering into a ship of Adramidium, Adramidium, we launched meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius, Curtis, Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. So what do you see there? Well, first of all, you see up there, verse 1, Paul and certain other prisoners. And what is he given? He's given liberty. Okay? Um, he's let out of prison. All right? There are certain rules and, and things and, that you must do as a prisoner. And when somebody gives you liberty from that, then you can make up your own mind. Here's time off. You can go out and you can just kind of, I'm going to give you liberty there. That's what Paul was given. Hmm. Interesting. Galatians chapter 3. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Okay. Interesting point here. When you're kept under the law and shut up, basically, you're what? You're in prison. All right. Very interesting there. What was the Old Testament law? The Old Testament law was a prison. People go to prison because they have problems with their flesh. Think about that one. Um, what was the whole system of law, the Levitical law that the Old Testament Jews had to live under? It was because they had problems with their flesh. Don't eat that. Don't touch that. Don't wear that. Don't fornicate that way. Don't do this way. Don't do, you know, problems with the flesh. They're kept under that. So, New Testament liberty is basically, the, the best way to define it is, um, there are commandments in the New Testament, no doubt. Uh, we don't have to keep, keep the Ten Commandments to stay saved or whatever else, or be Torah observant or some other thing like that. No. Um, but we can, when we read the New Testament, there are definite laws there, but there are three areas I'm going to show you today where you have liberty, where you can be let out of that thing of keeping that Old Testament law. See, in the New Testament, when you're reading it, we lose context sometimes and we, and we forget that in the first century there were more Jewish Christians than Gentile Christians. Okay, now it's the opposite. A lot more Gentile Christians than Jewish Christians. But you had these Jews, they're coming out from the Old Testament, they're transitioning into the New Testament, and they're saying, wait a second here, if this Gentile gets saved, does that mean that they're going to have to abstain from pork? Does that mean they're going to have to observe Jewish feast days? Does that mean that the women are going to have to wear a head covering, physical head covering? And Paul's saying, no. We're going to show, I'm going to show you the, the scriptures here where the answer is no. Those three areas, your diet, what you eat, in other words, celebration of holidays, and physical head coverings for women, those are three areas of liberty where you have Old Testament Jews can still do those things, but they can't force a New Testament Gentile Christian to do those things. I should say New Testament Jews and New Testament Gentiles, say it that way. Um, they can't force them to do those things. There's an issue of liberty. But I'm going to look at today, I'm going to show you these three things, but I'm also going to show you what happens when a Christian today sins against that liberty. When you start to judge another man's conscience or judge another man's liberty by your conscience, something that you're convicted by. In plainer words, if I see some Jew out there and, and uh, he says he's a Christian, and I say, yeah, I noticed though when you went over to that concession stand, you didn't get a hot dog. You wouldn't get a, a, a pork sausage or something like that. You didn't get any bacon. You must not be saved. 
See, you need to be eating pork because you see my ancestors are German and my and Germans are very big into eating pork and things like that. So therefore, if you're not eating pork, you're probably not saved. See, what am I doing? I'm going against his liberty. He has liberty to continue doing the things he, that are there from the Old Testament. Uh, there's dietary laws and, and things like that. Uh, but I have liberty as a Gentile Christian to say, hey, you know what? I am going to eat that stuff that you don't want to eat as a Jewish Christian. And we're going to get into more of this stuff as we continue here. Romans chapter 8. Go to Romans chapter 8. And I'm just going to tell you right now, I've had people sin against liberty and judge me and judge my ministry because I don't take a strong stand against holidays or I don't take a strong stand against you know, eating pork or some kind of thing like that. And they'll, they'll judge me. They'll throw out my whole ministry because of those areas of liberty. It's a problem. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 20 through 21. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The bondage of corruption. You see, when you're under the Old Testament law, those laws are there to condemn you. They are the, your schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. They're to, to, there to show you that you're a sinner, that you're rotten. But you can't live under those laws. You can't continually have to keep those laws. When you get saved, God says, okay, now I'm going to give you some liberty there. I want to show you this stuff as we continue in the scriptures there. But it's a glorious thing to have that freedom. You don't have to become a Jew, in other words, to all the, you know, when you get saved, you've got to become Jewish or something like that. That's not it. So, like I said, we're going to look at diet, physical head coverings for women, and then celebration of holidays. So let's start out with diet while we're in the book of Romans, chapter 14. Go to Romans chapter 14. And by the way, you know, don't just watch these videos as an entertainment type of a thing and whatever else, and oh, I like this and whatever. Um, you need to actually be watching this and writing these scriptures down. Uh, writing this stuff down so that when you encounter people that attack you on these areas, you can say, wait a second, you know what, you're judging my liberty. Um, I'm not a Jew under the Old Testament law. And I'm not a Jew that's trying to keep those things that I had from the Old Testament now as a New Testament Christian. I'm a Gentile Christian. I'm saved and God's given me liberty in these areas. Okay, Romans chapter 14. Let's look here at the verses 1 through 4. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. A little bit of a double meaning there. You know, you can say, well, you're weak, you're a weakling if you eat, you know, just vegetables or whatever. That's not what it says. It says herbs, okay? Um, and it's kind of interesting because there's many times when you will be weak, you're sick or whatever else, and you should be eating some herbs, Herbal cures and things like that are very, very potent, very strong. All right. Kind of an interesting thing there. Um, but uh, verse 3, Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be able, or he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Okay. Um, if you see somebody... And they don't want anything to do with meat and whatever else. Okay, fine. Um, they believe that they should be eating just vegetables and fruits and whatever. Okay, that's okay. Uh, we're not supposed to divide over that. Um, and then don't turn around and judge me because I do eat meat. And I be, eat all things. Meat and fruits and vegetables and herbs and, you know, the whole thing. Um, you know, Lester Roloff, I have a great deal of respect for the man. Um but the guy was just a radical vegetarian. I mean, there's a sermon of his out there where he's cutting on meat and he's twisting the scriptures and all kinds of stuff. And I'm just thinking, ugh, ugh, ugh. that's a problem. And he's calling, you know, meat is filthy, disgust and, you know, slimy and all stuff. I mean, you know, the greasy sausage you're putting down your throat, hey man. You know, just thinking, yeah, what's, you know, what's he doing? Uh, he's judging another's liberty. He's sinning against liberty is what he's doing. Um, when you start to say that somebody shouldn't be eating meat, um, you're missing it. Okay? Uh, that's a problem. 
go to Acts chapter 10. I'll show you when this thing changed, if you're not aware of it. Acts chapter 10, you say, well, I, but when did it change? When did it be okay, become okay to eat meat? Where in, the, where in the New Testament does it say that a, a Christian, you know, a Jewish Christian can eat, you know, um, pork or other unclean type of animals? Well, I'll show you. Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 16. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they had made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have eaten, I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. See, he's saying, No, no, this is Levitical law. I'm following Old Testament law here. I can't eat that stuff. Uh, verse 15, And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Okay, and you know, I realize the application there is it's you know there there it's a, acts as a transitional book, and you're having the Jews saying that the Gentiles are unclean, and God has cleansed them and whatever. I understand that there's a spiritual aspect to it, but it also does relate to the food issue, to what you know. I mean, he's hungry, and the Lord says, "Arise, you know, and kill and eat." Here. And I'm going to show you that it does relate, in fact, to the actual thing of eating meat. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Okay? Not a very good thing. And what are they saying? What are these lies, these seducing spirits and doctrines of devils? What are they? Verse 3, forbidding to marry, like Catholic priests, and many others too, by the way, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. You say, well, it, it just says meats. It doesn't say anything. Okay, see, there's just, it's just talking about, you know, vegetarianism. There's certain meats that are still unclean and whatever else. Um, keep reading. Verse 4, For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Right there. And I, I can't tell you how many people have sent me articles over the years of how, how bad pork is, how pork has got parasites in it, and it's got all this other stuff. Um, and I say, okay, and what is the pork? Where is it being produced? Um, you can prove that any type of food is bad if you look at the factory farms. Okay, beef is bad when you look at the big ag factory farms where the cows are just in a stall in their own filth, standing there on a concrete floor, and they're and they're just you know the food's brought to them. They stick their head through the little metal thing, and and they come uh, you eat some you know some straw or whatever, and and uh, or hay, I guess, whatever, and then and then they just defecate right there, and then they just kind of stay there. I mean, I've seen those those things back when I was in Lancaster County. There was there were a lot of those types of farms, um, and you and you say, oh, see, beef is really bad for you. Red meat's bad for you. Uh, no, it isn't. And you look and you see a grass fed, you know, grass fed beef, where the the cattle are out there in the fields and out in a nice pasture, and they're. They're eating all those wild grasses and getting all the nutrients from the wild grasses. The meat is incredibly good for you. Incredibly good for you. You say, but, but pork. What about pork? Uh, well, why don't you look into Joel Saladin? Okay, J-O-E-L, -J Joel, S-A-L-A-D-I-N, Saladin. Okay, look up his thing on pasture-raised pigs. Hmm, pigs can be raised the same way out in the grassland and things like that. And we've had, uh, we get, when we get pork, we get, make sure it's not, has no antibiotics in it. Um, you know, uh, woodland swine and things like that. Uh, woodland swine meat is incredible. It tastes totally different than just the regular, you know, factory produced pork. But I mean, I could, I could cut on vegetables and say that, you know, see, look, here's, 
GMO vegetables, and, and uh, that proves that all vegetables are bad because GMOs are bad for you. They, they basically engineer, you know, pesticides and herbicides and things into these um, crops, and you eat that stuff and it messes up your liver and all kinds of other things. So there, that proves that the vegetables are bad. No, it doesn't. Okay, it does not do anything of the kind. Uh, you have no scripture saying that a Christian can't eat pork, and you don't even have any good scientific argument. Okay, again, another one is, is milk. That's another one I'll hear, you know, uh, uh, milk is actually bad for you. Well, are you talking about store-bought, the processed, you know, homogenized and pasteurized and all that other stuff, uh, milk from big, big ag farms, or are you talking about grass-fed, you know, milk? You know, grass-fed cattle that produce milk. Uh, off the charts, good for you. You know, so watch out for that that type of a thing there. People will get you on that. Um, try to make you think that you somehow can't eat, uh, you know, certain types of animals, and pork especially is the one that they usually go after. But, um, and you know, if you're Jewish, you don't have to eat pork all of a sudden. You don't have to all of a sudden just switch your diet. Go to Galatians chapter 2. I'll show you one that did, though. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. Eat with the Gentiles? Huh. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Hmm. And don't tell me it was just, oh, you know, they made sure that Peter's food was kosher and, and uh, you know, and, and it was, you know, it was just he, it was a fellowship issue. Uh-uh. Peter was eating the, the kind of meat that uh, was forbidden to Jews. Promise you that. Why? Acts chapter 10. Arise, Peter, kill and eat. What God hath cleansed that, call not thou common. Uh, oh, so, well, you can't prove. Okay, let me ask you a question. Would Peter have been in sin if you're out there saying, I don't agree with you, I think it was just a fellowship thing. Okay, would Peter have been in sin if he had eaten pork in Galatians chapter 2? Give me some New Testament scripture on that, please. Verse 13, And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Dissimulation means you're a hypocrite. Okay? <laughs> but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, you're a new creature now. You have liberty, the glorious liberty. Okay, that's promised you. I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Hmm. That was a rebuke there. You're not supposed to compel the Gentiles to live like the Jews. Why? There's liberty there. And I see all these people, you know, they get, they get, uh, they profess to be saved, and yet they're going and they're trying to act like they're Jewish or something like this. And that's not supposed to be that way. You got to watch out for that. Next, let's talk about physical head coverings from for women. Go to First Corinthians, chapter eleven. You know, you start to come down on somebody for uh, eating a certain way or whatever else, and you start to try to throw Old Testament stuff into it. You're taking people back under the law. You're putting them back in prison. Uh, not supposed to be there. Okay? It's not going to mess you up spiritually if you eat bacon. All right? Not going to mess you up at all. It's not going to mess you up if you eat some herbs a little bit. Or, you know, as much as you want. I could care less what Lester Olaf ate and whatever else. Vegetarian, okay, fine, whatever, that's fine. But don't come out and preach a, a radical sermon condemning those of us that eat meat. See, you're starting to sin against liberty at that point in time. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 16. I did a whole study on this, but I'm going to go through it again. There's different types of things going on here in this passage, and I'll show you that. Verse 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Okay? Now obviously my wife's head 
does not, it's not my head, physical head. What's it talking about? It's talking about spiritual headship here. My head is not the head of Jesus Christ. Okay, it's talking about spiritual. Keep that in mind. Verse 4, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Oh, then it's physical now. No, it still is spiritual. Right? You don't have any kind of a, you know, uh, pray to Jesus Christ in the name of Brian Denlinger or something like that. You know, I'm your holy priest and you have to pray through me to Jesus. No, no. If you're a man, you pray directly to Jesus. Get that. Verse 5, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. Right? And now people try to make that a physical thing. I don't believe it's physical at this point in time. It gets physical later on. You'll see it talk about physical covering. But this is talking about a woman is supposed to have a spiritual headship. You're not supposed to be a feminist that's out doing your thing and single and sassy and all this other stuff. Uh-uh. No. A woman is supposed to have a father when she's young and then a husband. And if she doesn't have that, if she's a single woman, then she should have a pastor who is spiritually a head over her that protects her from the spiritual realm. Verse 6. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Okay? And again, I, I already did a whole study on this, so I'm not going to get into a whole lot on that. Verse 7. For a, man, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. Okay? And again, uh, so that means a man can't ever wear a hat? No. It's not talking about that. Right? It's talking about spiritual covering there is what you're dealing with. Um, verse 9, Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Are we talking about physical covering? No. How can you have power on your head? What does that mean if it's a physical covering? What, is, what does a power on your head thing mean? You know, battery-powered hat? Uh, no. Power on her head is meaning a spiritual covering. That's what we're talking about. Um, verse 3, down through here, um, is down through 10, I'll say, is about a spiritual covering. That's what it's talking about here in context. It doesn't get into the physical covering until the next couple of verses here. Verse 11, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves. Okay? Now we change. Notice he says, judge in yourselves. Is there any judge in yourselves up here in verses uh, 3 down through 12? No. He's explaining things. Right? Women are not supposed to usurp authority over the man. They're to be in silence. Okay, um, that's the way. That's what the Bible teaches. There's supposed to be spiritual headship there over a woman. Don't like that? Well, you know, you're not going to be saved if you don't like that. But um, look at verse 13. Judge in yourselves. You have liberty, in other words. Is it comely that a that a woman pray unto God uncovered? We just got done telling you about that she's supposed to have a covering. What's he talking about? Well, he just switched from spiritual covering to now a physical covering. Again, Orthodox Jewish women of today still believe that they should wear a wig or some other thing on their hair and that only their husband is to see their actual real hair. And so women of today, Jewish women of today, Jewish women of the past, believe that they are supposed to have a physical cloth or whatever kind of covering on their head. That's what Paul's talking about. And he says, judge in yourselves. Is it only that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Again, if we're still talking spiritual, what does this have to do with anything? It's talking about physical now. right? And Paul's comparing. Look what he says in the next verse. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. So a Jewish woman that says, I believe I should have some kind of a cloth covering on there to cover my hair so nobody can see it but my husband, she can't look at a Gentile Christian and say, uh, you're wrong. You have your hair uncovered there. Your hair is not 
you know, you're, it's just your your hair, your long hair hanging down your back and whatever else. That's wrong. That's she can't say that. Why? Because Paul's saying, hey, there's supposed to be a difference between the two sexes here. The man's not to have long hair. It's a shame unto him. He looks like a woman. You know, the woman, on the other hand, if she has long hair, it's a glory to her. You ever see a woman with really long hair? I thank the Lord my wife has very long hair. Uh, women with short hair is just always kind of bleh, you know. I mean, I, I, there's so many times I see, you know, I'll see some older couple walking or I'll see a couple walking and from behind you think, okay, which one's the man, which one's the woman? I guess the smaller one's the woman, I guess, you know. That's an abomination. God doesn't want it that way. God wants to see difference. You see? Verse 16, But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Don't be contentious about this. A Jewish woman doesn't have to give up a cloth head covering. A Gentile Christian, you know, saved Jewish woman, doesn't have to give up her cloth covering. A saved Gentile woman doesn't have to start wearing a cloth covering. Okay? Judging yourselves. We have no such custom. It's up to you. It's an area of liberty. But what happens when a Christian starts to sin against that and starts to get to, to judge in other people and whatever else, judging salvation based on something that's a liberty issue? You see? Things fall apart. You start to get away from where God wants you to be. And finally, we're going to look at the last one, the, the big controversial one here, Romans chapter 14, uh, the thing of holidays. <clears throat> here we go. Um, we're just a few days away from Thanksgiving here. Uh, I'm not even sure when it is, two days or something like that. Um, and Christmas is coming after that. And oh boy, if, if, you're, if you're on the side of Christmas, then you're not saved and I have to quit your whole ministry. got a letter not long ago, a month or two ago, and some, some woman was saying about her teenage son got away from video games and, and uh, was learning so much about the Bible and his whole life changed and everything. And, and um, she got right with God and whatever, and they were just studying the Bible together. And then they found that I'm not anti-Christmas, and he said, I'm not listening to Brian anymore. I'm done. I'm finished with his ministry. <laughs> uh, then you sinned against liberty because celebration of holidays is a liberty issue. Okay? Let me show you. Re Romans chapter 14, verses 5 through 12. And I, I have never met one anti-Christmas Christian that's like radically, vehemently opposed to it. I mean, there's people that say, eh, don't wait. I don't waste my time on it. It doesn't mean anything to me. That's fine. I mean, there's, there's been times in our marriage we've been so busy we don't even have time to celebrate Christmas, really. Uh, earlier on when Oliver was just a really little baby, I mean, we, we just kind of eh, don't really have time this year. I'm not going to put up any kind of tree or get presents or whatever else. Or just, eh, whatever. That's my stand. I don't really care either way. Somebody doesn't really like Christmas. They had a bad experience as growing up. Okay, fine. Don't mess with it. Somebody wants to celebrate Christmas in their own way, bring glory to the Lord through it. Okay, fine. Do that. But when you get these people and they just, you know, you have to stop listening to any preacher that says that, you know, that you can celebrate Christmas because they're wicked. They're of the devil. Um, you get a problem there. And I'm going to show you some big problems here in just a little bit. And, you know, and, and I know how radical people are, you know, and stuff like that. You know, oh, I don't want to hear what Brian has to say if he's for Christmas and, and whatever. I don't just just calm down and listen to some arguments. OK, I went through the whole thing myself uh, years and years ago. I was radical anti-Christmas and I was saying it's of the devil and all this other stuff. And I listened to a, a sermon from Peter Ruckman and just kind of smacked me across the head and said, you know, hey, this is a liberty issue. And the Lord convicted me and I said, oh, OK then I shouldn't be taking a real strong stand in that area. All right, Take a strong stand against the new versions. Take a strong stand against somebody preaching a false gospel. Take a strong stand against somebody you know, attacking Jesus Christ by defending the Trinity. Um, whatever. That stuff is fine. Those are doctrinal issues. But a liberty issue, when you start to sin against that and you start to get radical, you get messed up big time. And I'm going to show you that. Romans chapter 14, verse 5 through 12. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Liberty. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. 
He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he, he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. Liberty issue. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You know, and again, if you're just judging me on liberty issues, you got a problem there. You know, and if I'm somehow out of fellowship, well, I'm going to be judged. All right, the Lord's going to judge me. You know, it's just crazy. Verse 11, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you right now, I guarantee you, I'm not going to have to give an account for, for saying uh, we like to have some Christmas celebration type of stuff. For having some fun at that time of the year and enjoying the lights, the pretty lights. I mean, again, I've, I've known these people and they don't even want to drive, you know. Oh, look at the wicked abomination, bail lights, and the, oh, the, the god and goddess and all this other stuff. You get so kooky and wacky. <laughs> You get into this whole anti-Christmas thing, and you know, as a, it's it's somehow this horrible, great evil, and whatever else. I'm not saying somebody doesn't want to waste their time on it. That's fine, but uh, and you become just a total hypocrite and a liar. Uh, and I'll show you that Colossians chapter two, verse sixteen and seventeen says here, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. You know, when you start to study some of these ancient heathen type of celebrations and whatever else, like Yule and whatever, it's actually, you know, I did a study on the thing of answering Christmas criticisms and I talked about this. Um, they're actually, it's heathen people that don't know about the gospel and this stuff is being you know, they're, they're celebrating these, these things and there's elements of the gospel in there. Jesus dies and he's buried and resurrects, glorified, you know. Uh, the, the Yule ceremony, that's what a lot of that stuff is. You say, but, but we can put it away now and all, all this. I, I know. I don't, I'm not saying you have Santa Claus and you do all the other stuff. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if there's elements of a holiday, holiday that you can do that are innocent, what does it matter? It's your culture. Right? God doesn't want us to give up our culture. God didn't say to the Gentile Christians, now as soon as you get saved, you have to become a Jew right away. You got to Jewish feast days, you got to become change your name to some Jewish thing, stop, stop saying Jesus, start saying, saying Yeshua and all. That's not there. That's not there. Just a bunch of nonsense. But I'm going to give you some problems for anti-holiday professing Christians. Okay? And, and th these are things I've dealt with for many, many years. Okay? These, these anti-Christmas people just, just tick me off majorly. All right? And again, Shane, I'm, I, I don't celebrate Christmas. You know, whatever. Okay, fine. But don't you condemn me and don't you judge me and call me false and whatever else because I don't do the same things that you do. Don't judge my liberty because of your conscience, in other words. Problem number one for anti-Christmas Christians. Okay, and it's, it's Christmas is the big one because, you know, that's, that's kind of the big one. I don't care about Easter or a lot of, you know, Halloween or whatever else. But uh, I think, you know, Thanksgiving is fine. You should be, you know, thankful for what you have. You know, you're to be thankful for everything. And everything give thanks, the Bible says. But uh, number one, you become a liar. Okay? Um, every anti-Christmas thing I've ever heard, they'll say that uh, Christmas is two words, Christ and Mass. And so when you say Merry Christ Mass, you're saying that you're happy about the death of Christ. You're happy about the Eucharistic celebration. Um, proof? None. There's not one shred of proof for that. Okay, MAS. I did this in you know showed this in my study. MAS Christmas uh, means celebration of. So Christmas literally means a celebration of Christ. Um, it doesn't mean the Mass of Christ. Somebody told you that they're a liar. They're lying right to your face. But let's just go with this for a minute. Okay. Oh, they told the truth. They showed the sources. They Okay. Um, where is the Eucharist in any part of traditional Christmas celebration? Where's the Mass? 
where is there a priest? Well, you know, Santa Claus comes down the chimney and whatever else. And I don't mess with Santa Claus, so I'm not defending that. But Santa Claus comes down the chimney and, and he gets there and he gets, gathers the whole family around. And he says, okay, let's elevate the host. And then we're going to do the wine. And, you know, where's it at? I mean, if Christmas is about the mass of Christ, and then where's it at in the traditional celebration? Uh, it's not there. So you end up having to lie about it. And these people do that. Brian Moonan's one of them. He's one of the liars out there. It's come out with a whole series of videos attacking Christmas and, oh, you're just wicked. If you, if you celebrate Christmas, then you're wicked. Please. <laughs> yeah, okay. And it's funny, too, because, you know, oh, it's, it's Christmas. It's Christ Mass. Oh, okay, then why is it that a lot of other cultures don't even call it Christmas? In German, it's, it's Weihnachten, Holy Night. A lot of cultures say Holy Night or Night of the Holy Child. Uh, if, if it's this great Christmas, this Catholic conspiracy or Saturnalia or some kind of thing like this, why, does it, why isn't it called that? Secondly, and here's another big one, you become a hypocrite when you become anti-Christmas. Right? And, and again, to clarify, you don't want to celebrate Christmas? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the people that, that judge a man's ministry because he doesn't condemn Christmas and anybody that celebrates Christmas. You become a hypocrite. How so? Um, well, think about it. What are the days of the week? Sunday, Moon Day, Tyre's Day, called Tuesday, Woden's Day, Thor's Day, Frigg's Day, Saturn Day. You're going to change the days of the week, the names of the days of the week because they're pagan, named after Norse gods and other pagan gods. You're going to change the days of the week. You better, because you got to get all those, you know, heathen things out of your life. Okay, how about uh, Christmas bonuses and time off from your job? No, sir, I'm going to work because I hate Christmas. It's a terrible time. See, it's a problem. Uh, a lot of these anti-Christmas Christians won't do that. How about the, the dollar bill? Do you reject those at the store when somebody gives them to you as change? I don't want that dollar bill. It's got satanic symbols on the back, and it does. Announcing the conception of a new order that's secular. Annuit Shaptus Novus Order Seclorum. And the pyramid with the all-seeing eye above it. It's a satanic symbol. Do you reject that? See? You start to become a hypocrite. You select, you know, the things that you're against and the things that you're for. You, well, you just kind of, you know, yeah. <laughs> Number three, you must steal from the Jews. See, that's the big one. You sin against liberty, and so then you have to go back and say, now we're Jews. Okay? Let me demonstrate. Um, I can't have anything to do with holidays because they're pagan and evil and wicked and whatever else. Even birthdays are bad. Anything that's a holiday is wicked. It's of the devil. Okay? Um, what do you do about the Jews in the Bible, including the Lord Jesus Christ when he was here on the earth and the Apostle Paul? both of whom celebrated Jewish feast days. Well, the wingnut uh, anti-Christmas Christian comes out and says, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess I can't be totally against all holidays because they actually celebrated holidays in the New Testament. Hmm, and Jesus did as well. Uh, uh, so I guess maybe I'll have to start doing Jewish feast days. Yeah. And then you can also go back to Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, and talk about the Christmas tree, you know, and all this stuff. And, and uh, you got to steal that too, because you see that's written to Jews under the law. And somehow you got to make it, you know, learn not the way of the heathen. Um, the heathen there in the Old Testament is you, okay, if you're a Gentile. All right? And uh, the Bible doesn't say it was a sin, it says it's vain. Their traditions are vain. And it goes on to say you don't even have, there's nothing to really fear there. It's just there's. Nothing in them to do good, do good or to do evil. Or just yeah, don't worry about it. See, people get so desperate. And see, the devil knows that if he can get you off on the liberty issue, you'll go right back under the law again. You'll start to get very legalistic. And now you'll start to say, that woman out there, she doesn't have a head covering on. And that guy out there, he ate pork. He's not right with God. And oh, look at that Christmas tree. Christmas lights. Oh, you know. You start to become a nut. First Corinthians chapter ten.
You know, it's, it's, it's nice to be able to enjoy yourself once in a while, you know? Maybe you had bad Christmases growing up and it doesn't mean anything to you, but I didn't. I had good Christmases. That was my favorite time of the year. And I thought about Jesus Christ and how He came to the earth. It wasn't all just, you know, oh, just money, just bringing in, you know, come on, Santa Claus and whatever else. And I was taught about Santa Claus growing up. It wasn't that my parents, I mean, they were professing Christians, but they didn't say, you know, eh, Santa Claus is not true. They, they had me believe in that thing growing up. I'm not scarred by it or anything else. You know, I don't, we don't teach Oliver about that. We just, no, Santa Claus is stupid. But, you know, we teach him how that Jesus Christ came to the earth to give us the gift of salvation, you know. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 through 33. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Okay? Can you celebrate Christmas? Yes, you can. Is it expedient? Well, that depends on how you look at that. I would say yes to that. Very much expedient. Um, I remember going to the store here one time and... and uh, I remember there was an older woman, and she was just so excited. She, she, I was walking past her, and she said, "Looks like we're gonna have snow for Christmas," and she was all excited. I said, "Yeah," I said, "Isn't that great?" And, and you know, just had a little conversation with the woman. How many times have you had a chance to witness to people at Christmas time because they're they're in that holiday spirit? They're happy, they're enjoying themselves. But I guess that's that's evil, right? Hmm. And it's uh, sometimes a lift your spirits too. Seeing the pretty lights out there, reflecting off the snow, and, and thinking about getting something really nice for somebody that you love. Making something with your hands to give to a loved one. About this time of the year, you start to think, you know what, I'd really like to make that thing and give it to them on Christmas. It's a good thing. Okay? If you don't want to do it, that's fine. But you can't say it's wicked and evil, right? And the other issues as well. I just, let's continue. <laughs> Verse 24, Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. Okay, there you're back to the thing of you can eat whatever. It's a liberty issue. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and you be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. Okay, again, there's nothing there as far as, oh, I'm a Jew. Wait a second, I shouldn't be eating pork or whatever. No, it's not there. But there is a stipulation. Verse 28, But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Okay, this is a spaghetti dinner that's going to benefit the local Catholic charity. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I really don't want my money going to the Catholic Church. Oh, really? Why not? Chance to witness. See, that's what's going on there. Um, okay, uh, verse 29. Conscience, I say not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? Okay. You shouldn't be judging somebody else's liberty issue there that if they have the liberty to do something, you shouldn't judge it based on your conscience. You had bad Christmases growing up. Don't judge me because I had good Christmases and want to continue a lot of that tradition. Okay? Um, you've gotten sick off of pork. Don't judge me because I eat pork. You believe it's right for a woman to keep her head covered physically. Um, don't judge my wife because she lets her long, beautiful hair uh, down in public. You see how that works? Um, verse 31, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people that start to think about Jesus at this time of the year. There's others that don't. Okay, and I realize YouTube is kind of a weird thing because it's just a public platform. I could get a, a Jew watching this or I could get a Gentile watching this. The Jew gets ticked off because I'm talking about Christmas. The Gentile gets, gets feeling very nostalgic and very, oh boy, it brings back some happy memories and things. And 
little Christmas music in the background or something, they say, oh man, that really makes me feel good. And they think about Jesus and it's a little bit challenging. But the point is, if you're dealing with people um, in different situations, you know, you have liberty there. You need to be flexible on those issues. And for crying out loud, don't write off a ministry because some guy, you know, doesn't agree with you in one of these areas of liberty. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 12 through 18. says here, I would they were even cut off which trouble you. Yeah, there's a lot of people on YouTube that I'd like to see cut off. <laughs> they trouble people. Uh, they come out and they pervert the gospel. They come out and they, you know, pervert all kinds of truth and whatever else. It's just it's disgusting. Verse 13, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. You've been called unto liberty. Okay, not it's just a thing, that, you know, just kind of there. You've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. You've got to be real careful about that. If there's a liberty issue between you and a brother or sister or whatever, um, don't let it get to a point where you consume one another. Like this thing I heard about. A uh, young man that got away from video games and, and professed to be saved and whatever else. I, I don't know. I don't know people. You know, there's very few people I actually talk to. Uh, there are some people I've Skyped back and forth with and whatever else, and I feel that they're saved. Uh, but there's a lot of people I have no idea about. So I'm saying I don't know the real testimony of this young man, but to just, you know, write off my whole ministry, you know, everything the Lord taught him through me, just write it off because I don't come out radical against Christmas. That's wrong. And don't you do it either. Okay? And by the way, when it says there, uh, you know, verse 13, use not liberty for an occasion of the flesh. Okay, well, obviously. Don't just, uh, you know, get yourself into all kinds of debt because you want to sell Christmas or, or have Christmas type of things and buy gifts for people and whatever else. That's a bad idea. Don't mess around with your health and, and whatever. Make fun of vegetables. You need some vegetables in your diet, okay? And, and don't certainly make fun of a, a saved Jewish woman because she wants to wear something on her head, you know. But finally, finally let's go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Yeah. Um, you have liberty, Christian, but don't use it for a cloak of maliciousness. Uh, don't use it for an occasion of the flesh. Um, and certainly don't sin against that liberty and start to judge other Christians and bite and devour them because you disagree with them on some kind of an issue that really is not that important. Just as simple as that. Um, with this holiday season coming up, uh, there's a chance I might be doing some, some preaching, some gospel messages uh, with a Christmas theme to them. And uh, I, I know, I mean, I, I can say, don't judge me, but I know that they're going to. I know that people are going to come out and they're going to judge me and they're going to attack me if I do any kind of Christmas-related thing. Uh, Christmas is a very special time of the year um, to us. My wife and I both, uh, we had a lot of different things in our childhood. She definitely had a worse childhood than I did. But both of us really loved the Christmas season. And our son, he just adores Christmas time. And it's not because, oh, I get things. A lot of times it's just he doesn't even think about the gifts that he gets. We give him three gifts. That's all he gets. You know, and and because uh, we teach him about the Bible and gold, frankincense, myrrh. Jesus got three, so you get three. You know, and I realize it wasn't at Christmas time. I know, I know. You know, but it's what we teach him. And uh, so he's not getting heaps and heaps and heaps of toys or anything. But he just he loves the lights. He loves the music. He loves to go out and and 
just be outside. It starts snowing, and he's saying, it's Christmas time, it's Christmas. No, it's not Christmas time yet. You know, he keeps saying to me, well, Dad, when is Christmas time? You know, and, and uh, he gets excited about it. Uh, maybe you don't want to do that with your family. That's fine. Whatever. Um, if I ever meet some Jews, some saved Jews, and they come to our property, uh, I'm not going to say, you know, hey, you got to eat some pork here or whatever. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say, what do you want to eat? I'll make you a meal that doesn't have a trace of anything pork related or, or any other unclean type of a thing. Whatever. I don't have a problem with that. Somebody come and say, I'm a vegetarian. You know, I don't want anything to do with meat. Okay, I'll make you something that's completely meat free. Somebody come say, I, I really like meat. I'll make you meat. <laughs> you know? Uh, some, some woman come and she has a fe uh, physical head covering, cloth head covering on of some kind or whatever. Okay, that's great. Whatever. Don't judge my wife because she doesn't have one on. You see how that works? So I just thought I'd bring that study out, get into this time of the year, and you start getting the radical Christians coming out and, and uh, proclaiming the gospel of Christmas hate and all this other stuff. <laughs> and uh, don't let it kill your joy, brethren. Um, it just it irks me. <laughs> uh, so that's going to be it. I could rant and rave about that for a while, but I'm just going to let that one go. Um, you have liberty. You know, make up your own mind, judging yourself. Okay, um, but whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Um, Christmas time is a great time to witness to people. Uh, it's a real good time for that. So, enough said. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you in the next study.